Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the In the Paint Show presented by Ball is Life, episode 146. I'm with my longtime co host, Chelsea Hopkins and Ani Umana, back for another episode. How are you guys doing this morning? Doing well. How are you guys? I'm doing good. You know, another episode. I'm excited about it. Yeah, a little different. We're going to honestly talk about some current events, but we're going to take, go back in time a little bit and kind of talk about the NBA and how it was many years ago, over 50 years ago, comparing it to now and comparing it to some of the current things that are happening off the court in the league. And we've talked about this on on various podcasts about, you know, player coach relations, owner coach and owner player relations and, and just what it means and the amount of money the players are making and kind of give people an idea of what some of the players in yesteryear went through. So we're going to have some very special guests later on t- talking about their uh, documentary, the Raymond Lewis Alley legend documentary, something that I've followed for quite many years. And I'm, I'm glad it's out there again. We'll break it down and I'm sure people have, uh, their view of the documentary and what it means, especially if they know his story, but especially for Ani and Chelsea, for you guys who don't know his story that much, I want, we want to hear what you'd have to say, especially since you didn't know him as a young, as a young person, you didn't really know who he was. And, and a lot of people don't know who he is, even people that follow the NBA. So I'm glad the story came out, but wanted to just start off by first uh, telling everybody, you know, thanks. Hope they had a good holiday. Thanks for listening in again. Uh, there's still holiday deals at shop.ballslife.com. Um, you spend a hundred dollars or more and you get a, a free shoulder bag. So again, check it out at shop.ballslife.com and the uh, coupon codes for in the paint still work. I N T H E P A I N T still works. So appreciate it. Um, you know, Chelsea, let's just jump right into it. Um, you know, a lot of things have happened. You know, what do you think about like compass prep took over the number one spot in the fab 50 and then they already lose. And now it's like, okay, we kind of knew there wasn't a great team this year. Maybe Montverde just, you know, has a chance to be really good. They've been there before. And it's kind of the same thing we're seeing in college basketball. Just turnover. Uh, the freshmen are not all that great. You know, there's some good ones here and there. But they're not dominating as they were before. We know that there's a lot of older players in college basketball. Do you, do you think that's going to kind of balance itself out once this COVID hits? Or that the portal's just going to remain as it is? And colleges want to keep their job and they want older players. I mean, I think the transfer portal is where it's at, unfortunately. Um, I feel like these schools and these coaches are looking more towards the portal than just to kind of find a true, you know, high school player. Sure. Um, as far as the rankings and stuff go, I mean, we talked a lot about in our 550 show just about, you know, maybe there's a clear, a clear cut favorite, but you can see a lot of shakeup. Um, especially with the, the top several teams. So I'm not surprised that, you know, we're kind of seeing the board move around. Um, yeah. I feel like it's pretty expected. Um, sure. But I think just basketball has just changed in general. Like, you know, you talked about just freshmen and coming in and really making an impact. Like we're, we're not seeing that as much in my opinion. I feel like coaches are leaning towards just more experienced players, players that have come from a school before, you know, have one or two years under their belt and, and they're ready to come in and make an impact. Sure. Um, you see now, like e- even of the top 100 kids that we had going in, um, to college this year, like, you know, how many of them are really playing and contributing on their teams? Yeah. How many of them are, you know, uh, living up to whatever their scouting report was? You know, he was a dynamic scorer in high school. Is that translating, you know, to the college court? So I think it's just, you know, that's kind of the way things are going right now. And I, I see the portal until it becomes regulated Um being around for a while and and you're starting to see how it's you know kind of shaking up into other sports as well like you know the Deion sure. Sanders story has been big and you oh, know yeah. he talks about his new opportunity so I, I think the portal is kind of the direction that you know college athletics um is, is headed gotcha. or will remain yeah I, Ani you know what's your sentiment there well, you know, it was surprising, especially who beat AZ Compass, right? Like, uh, yeah. who, as has been them. But, you know, it's funny. I talked to RJ Jones' dad. Yeah. Uh, I'll say, hey, you know, like, I heard they're kind of down this year. And he's just like, man, we're going to surprise y'all. Just wait. You know, and a couple yeah. weeks later, you know, they, they get the win. But uh, it's just, like, again, Ronnie and, like, Chels, you know, pointed. It's just this this season, there's no clear-cut favor like that. Sure. Uh, obviously, we do have tiers of, like, you know, there's going to be – your top three or four teams, but like when it comes down to number one, there's just not a clear cut team right now. There's right. no one that just really separated themselves. So we're going to see some different teams at number one this year. That's how I feel like. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about just uh, 
the portal and everything. You know, Chelsea's right. Coaches do are looking more into the portal. Like, you know, you me, you get calls about like, hey, who's who's gonna be out the portal? Who's the mid major guard or wing that you know is blown up that you know is gonna transfer? What's the NIL money looking like? What are they looking yeah. for? Uh but I would say, you know, this year though, for freshmen, I mean we talk about Khalil Ware, we talk about Keontae Joris, Kaysen Wallace, sure. uh, Jalen Hood Shafino, uh a man that's in uh Gigi Jackson in South Carolina. South you got Carolina, some yeah. guys that are starting getting minutes, Anthony Black, Jordan Walls, uh Nick Smith. You got guys that are starting are getting uh pretty decent minutes as freshmen this year. Mm-hmm. I do think that uh it it does speak on the 22 class being a strong class. Um yeah. but I I do think like yeah, it's portal. They want to really get to the portal, but sure. I do think that if you are a top 50 100 type player in the country and there's some guys that aren't even that and you know getting some minutes at some of these mid and like and, and highs um you have a chance to play you know yeah. obviously are you going to be in a situation where you're going to get 10 to 15 shots a game probably not unless you're just special yeah, like no, that no. but <laughs> and you know you got upperclassmen don't do that but you are i think we are seeing a decent amount of guys that are contributing to top 25 uh teams in the country this year yeah, definitely. Uh, just to run over some of what you and Chelsea said uh, about the class and, and the incoming class. So we got uh, 15 of the top 100 freshmen from ESPN's rankings. Again, those are their one one entities. 15 of the 100 are averaging double figures in points. So uh, 15 out of 100, 15 percent. Less than a third are getting 20 minutes per game. That that may be a little surprising. Again, we'd have to go back and see what the stats are over years and years over, which we don't have at our fingertips. But I've seen years where it's been higher than that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And we've probably, again, but we haven't seen college basketball from this year and last season where the average roster is much older. I, I, I was texting with a few people. I'm like, hey, dude, dude is 217. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you know that dude is 217, right? And some of these guys in 217 and 218 were already old then for their mm-hmm. class. You know, we know they, they're not 16 coming in. They were already old, 18 and a half to going on 19. So they're they're up there, 24, 23. Right. That makes a difference. If you're going 17 years old, you know, uh, trying to get on the court and you're going up against a guy who's a lot hungry um, mm-hmm. and been, been through the ringer a little bit, transferred once. There's no 23-year-old that hasn't transferred. You know what right. I mean? Right, right, right. So he's seen some stuff, kind of like we say. He's seen some shit. You know what I mean? So, Chelsea, I put you on the spot a little bit. Do you think, as not just players are more experienced, do you think a lot of transfer and portal guys are kind of, quote, unquote, like Greg Popovich is famous for saying, over themselves, that high school players kind of can get full of themselves? And that's normal. They get a lot of attention. It's easy to score. Kind of like our guy Kyle Anderson said, oh, high school's easy to score and be a star. Do you think that, uh, you know, a coach would like a player like that who maybe used to being yelled at, used to being like, hey, I'm, you know, you got to get better kind of thing. Already he's heard those words. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, just to piggyback off the Greg Popovich point, like yeah. uh, I'm not really a super, I was a transfer. So let me start there. Let yeah, me start sure, with that. Sure. I was a transfer. Yeah. Um, I don't like to hate on, you know, kids feeling that they have to move. I specifically transferred due to injuries. Sure. Um, and just basically being recruited on top of after I got hurt. Um, but I, I think that we're just seeing, like, I think it's just trendy to transfer. Like, okay. I look at a lot of these kids. I don't want to say a lot, but I've seen a handful of kids who are start at a school. You know, they're they're getting 30 minutes a game, shooting shooting 15 balls a game. Like, what, what could you possibly yeah. look, be looking for at your next opportunity? I mean, unless you're losing every game and you just want to be in a winning environment like you're getting your game off right, and and, sure. and now you see kids that are transferring two times like now they're on their third school in four yeah. years and I, I just think it's excessive I think it really speaks to just the mentality and just the what the shift that we're seeing in 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 NCAA yeah. athletics like when things are hard or when things aren't really convenient um I think it's just the easier thing to do to move on sure. to the next situation so I don't really think like um you know being coached hard or um you know, being in those situations is really what's kind of pushing these kids away or even keeping yeah. them there. I think they're sure. just looking at, OK, you know, eh, I'm not really liking it here, even though I get to do whatever or, you know, I'm not getting to do whatever. So I just move on to the next school. So I, I really think it's more trendy than anything else. Correct. Um, that's just what I'm saying with the the consistent movement. In the last several years in the portal, we've had, what, over a thousand kids. 
Like there's not even enough jobs for all the, you know, or scholarships for the amount of kids that are moving around. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing some type of regulation. I don't think kids should be able to transfer two and three times. I think that that's way too much. Um, okay. And I think that that's the only way to kind of change the tide is if, you know, we get some rules in place to kind of just balance it out. I, I feel like it's very excessive personally. Yeah, well, well, NILs kind of changed the game. You know, when you talk about yeah. some of these guys, I mean, some of these mid majors, we got to realize some of these low to mid major guys, or they will recruit a kid and say, do one or two years here and then transfer up. Yeah, we <laughs> you know, uh, or or it's like okay, a kid could be at a school in the Sun Belt. Hypothetically, he's getting X NIL. He's putting up fifteen a game. He's going to transfer because you know what a TCU or SMU or a big 12 or any school can offer NIL money. The kid's going to go to, you know, he can get double or triple that potentially. You see what I'm saying? You see that some of that going on. Um, I do agree with you. I think there's a lot going on with the portal, but you know, if me personally, I've seen some of the stuff that how a kid does get recruited and the stuff that they said the role is going to be <laughs> right. <laughs> and then when they go in and they're not getting that at all, you know, sometimes the player doesn't even trust the coach. They're like, yo, you told me I'm going to do this, this, and that. And I'm not even – I'm seeing three to five minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like yeah. I don't I don't blame them. I think you just got to fight through it. It's the yeah. business part of it. I think players got to realize – and not, not take a shot at well, – I guess I am, but, you know, how the player is going to be – how the coach is going to be on your official visit isn't how he's going to be when you walk on yeah. – when you get on Correct. camp. And Absolutely. I think that's where the issues start coming in because I hear players saying, oh, man, he said I was going to start. I'm not yeah. even playing. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah that's kind of, that. kind of far for the course. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I see what Chelsea's saying. Uh, to go back to her point, freshmen can take the, the rigors of getting berated or, or uh, you know, if you want to be coached up, it doesn't matter your age. I, I, I agree with that part. You know, if you're, if you're tough, mentally tough, and you're ready and you're physically ready, then, then you'll do it. Uh, you know, I don't think you have to be 22 or 23 year olds to transfer and to know that. So I, I agree with that point uh, for the most part. Uh, again, I do think some players, high school players do come in with they get humbled real quick. You know, their first couple practices, they, they get humbled real quick. And then to your point, Ani, do you think a lot of players now are getting this is a question for you. Are can I quote unquote getting played twice, meaning the high school to college recruitment, like you said, they, they get wine and dine on the recruit on the recruiting visits and then reality sets in. Do you think reality setting in twice or by the second time they should know, okay, I, I shouldn't have that high expectations. If a coach says I'm going to get, you know, 28 minutes a game, I, I need to know for myself what I'm really doing here. I, I think by the second time uh, yeah. they kind of understand what, yeah. what they're, what they're getting in. Um, yeah. Some of them don't, some of them sure. feel like, Oh, you know, it's going to be just better. Cause I trained the grass is going to be yeah. green on the other side. Yeah. Uh, and it, it is. And but I think for the most part, from just what I've seen, like guys kind of a little bit more realistic after that second time. I go, OK, like, let me not <laughs> go in completely green, like You're completely blind. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm going like it's going to be some work. He coach is saying these things. He says he won't utilize me like this, but there is a chance that it may not be like that. I still got to work and just be the yeah. player. Correct. So, I mean, the players have options. Uh, we know the coaches have always have options. They get out of their contracts all the time to change school. So that's changed a lot. And that's kind of the, the focus and theme of this episode 146 is just kind of like what's changed over the years with the players, uh, you know, having a, a voice, their relationship with the media, uh, you know, the owner's relationship with the players and, and just having the, those options. I know Chelsea feels that they should be regulated in some way at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the players have fought for a lot many years to be able to do things remember they you know back in uh 20 years ago i don't know if the rules the same like if in the pack 10 which is now the pack 12 you had to sit out two seasons if you transferred pack 12 to pack 12 so nobody ever did it obviously yeah. <laughs> you're suicide and then you have to sit out one year now it's just like open duck season you know mm-hmm. so it's changed over the the course of life i know players used to always leave like right before the christmas break because then they could transfer the next season in the second semester we've seen right. that happen a lot so Things have changed over the, you know, over course of time. And now we're at a thing where players have their own platform uh, or can create their own platform. And, and NBA players especially 
have enough money where they can kind of almost control their narrative, whether it's starting a media entity, a production company. I mean, players back when we're talking about 50 years ago with Raymond Lewis, when, you know, he's a 1971 high school graduate and we'll, we'll talk about him in a little more like they, they, these players didn't have those opportunities. You know, they, right. they just didn't, they didn't exist. And it was a star driven league. Then, you know, the teams weren't making all that much amount of money. And I think that kind of segues into our next topic was team, you know, not making that much money Did Deion Sanders, uh, great, one of the greatest NFL players of all time, uh, probably the one of the most marketable athletes of all time. Even mm-hmm. in college, Dion was well known. Uh, he transcended a lot of things, even as a player like I can, uh, races, uh, mm-hmm. you know, genders, people, uh, gender, uh, where he was, didn't matter. He played for the Cowboys, Falcons, people liked him, they gravitated toward him. And I yeah. think the same thing is in with, 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 with uh, his coaching career. And obviously, like, I know some people like over 30, maybe 40, when they hear him talk, they think that's the player. <laughs> said something funny. Like one guy was saying, I wouldn't be able to sit in that room without laughing. But it's like, we well, yeah, have these 20 year olds don't know Dion like that. You know, like yeah. Henry Glanville, Dion, San- uh, MC Hammer would be on the sideline with Dion at games. I mean, it was just like Dion was his own <laughs> production. You know what right. I mean? But going to the thing about money, like the HBCUs, we, we got to talk about that because we've talked about it before. We, we talked about um, uh, Maker, uh, Ani going to Howard, I believe. And everybody's like, oh, they're going to get a bunch of top 100 guys. HBCUs are going to get a bunch of players. This is changing. And this all happened around the time of the George Floyd racial reckoning thing. Right. Uh, 220. You know, we were at home a lot. COVID, you know, all of us were at home a lot. And it was like, this is going to change. But in reality, like Deion Sanders was making three hundred thousand dollars a year at, you know, at the school he was at, and and, and in Jackson State, and you know, even his salary over four years, like he put in money to the program, like that's not normal. (laughs) Nick Saban is not giving his money to Alabama, you know, like right, right, right. Everybody's on him. It's either like one side extreme. Or one side really for him. It doesn't seem to be no middle ground. I mean, I'm happy for him, you know. Uh, Colorado, he's going to the University of Colorado now, Boulder. Uh, Colorado's won before. So it's not like Colorado's, yes, Colorado's down. They're 1 and 11. They haven't really been relevant lately, but they've won before. So people are going to expect him to win. But I just wanted to get your guys' reaction. I'll start with you, Ani, like of him going there and is he getting a fair shake? And like, can people expect him to just, do a bunch of things at Jackson State or for HBC or did he do enough? Like, what do they, what do people expect him to do, especially when he's donating some of his salary to the school or to, the, and brought a lot of attention? Well, he left Jackson State in a better place than yeah. than he was when, when, when he got there. So sure. um, I, I have no problem him leaving. Uh, I know, you know, he values HBCUs and he valued Jackson State and he put his own money up to make sure it was successful. I think at the end of the day, when you see a guy and he left it better than what it was, at the end of the day, let him move on. Let him go make some more money. If Colorado sees his value and they, they offered him a lot of money, you can't tell him to turn that down, especially you got to still feed his family um, sure, sure. At, at the end of the day. So uh, I, I'm happy for him. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I don't think he did anything wrong as far as how he him leaving or anything because Jackson State – if they hire a quality coach, can continue to win. <laughs> sure. um, and I think that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Obviously, do you get as much publicity because Deion Sanders, uh, is he's not there anymore? No, but you, they, he left it in a good place. And you can't get mad at him for taking more money. At the end of the day, that's a big money difference between being a head coach, you know, at Colorado than Jackson State. Sure. You know, there's assistants making 300000 at <laughs> yeah, <laughs> play football no, no. more. You know, he's doing that as a head coach. So, Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, Ani, I mean, I'm with you. I totally agree. And, you know, let's be honest. Like, okay, he may have used Jackson State as a stepping stone, but Jackson State used him. You guys aren't getting this notoriety. You guys aren't getting these five-star recruits. You aren't getting upgraded facilities because I gave my money back to make sure you can do that. And you're probably not going to go 12-0 and like you did this season. So I, I just feel like, you know, sometimes people are looking for somebody to be a savior. And I know that Dion talks a great game, you know, definitely has a mouthpiece. He can, you know, say anything and people are going to get behind it. But but I just don't understand what the expectation was in terms of 
it was, he never said, I'm going to stay here forever. I'm going to be with this program for 50 seasons. So at some point you sure. had to know that the relationship was right. going to end. And, and I just feel like, you know, he put in his time, he left the place better than what he found it. And now he's taking the opportunities that bit, that he deserves because of what he was able to accomplish there. So I, I think I see how the ending could be bittersweet, but I really don't understand just the tremendous backlash he's gotten. Um, when, you know, I saw an interview from, I think the president of Jackson State saying that uh -huh. he was, you know, grateful for Dion's time there. But he said, "Look, like only 15% of our actual alums give back to the school. So sure. if you want to upgrade the abilities, you like there's a lot of different people that we can lean on. We just don't need to lean on Dion, you know, at, to be the one to, you know, change the game for for HBCU. So I just feel like it goes both ways, and it's unreasonable for people in general to not want to upgrade in life, whether you need the money or don't need the money." Correct. Like, you, you, people are saying he doesn't need the money, but we all need the money. Like, that, that's just <laughs> he doesn't that's need the money. <laughs> you can have your job at McDonald's yeah. today for $20 an hour. And if KFC offers you $28, you're leaving. Yeah. And that's just how it works. Yeah. So we all need the money. He's earned it. He's deserved it. Like I said, it's bittersweet because what he was able to do in a short amount of time and, you know, garnered a lot of attention for the program and all that's commendable. But yeah. it's time to move on and people should be excited for him, in my opinion. Gotcha. Now, this is on the same subject and we're talking about Dion, who's a well-known player, but let's talk about the HBCUs in it and in, in just in, the, in themselves. Um, just some interesting stats I've I seen and hopefully they're accurate. Just to pair Colorado to Jackson State, Colorado's finance, athletics are financed by their conference distribution, like TV money, 42% uh, of $47 million. Uh, government and institutional support, which, you know, that's a public school, so they get some kind of public funding, um, 22%. Corporate support, probably sponsorship and whatnot, that's 16%. So that equals about 80% of that $47 million. Now let's talk about Jackson State. And their athletics and how they're financed. Student fees, 35%. Mm -hmm. Institutional support, 21%. Ticket sales, 12%. So that's 86% of their 7.2 million. So again, the difference between 47 and 7.2 million. So are we educating enough people about what, like uh, the finances of them, Ani and stuff? Because I, that's what I get most from Dion. Because I, I followed Dion my whole life. You know, he, he, he was an idol for people when I was a kid. So I know everything about Dion. Right. Um, but I, people are learning more about Dion. But I think the great thing, if you can get something out of Dion, is learn how much uh, underfunded historically mm -hmm. like a HBCU's been and what needs to be done. Like Chelsea said, people are not maybe donating enough. Uh, it goes to the wealth gap, you know, like, let's say of an right. Ivy League school or even, even some of the Pac-12 schools. You know, people go to Colorado or University of Colorado have some wealth. There's some wealth there. Obviously, USC right. is a private school. We know that. They, they, they got money up the yin-yang. Stanford. And, and even, you know, like an Ivy League school doesn't even offer athletic scholarships. And the kids are well off. They get internships. They get donations, grants, that kind of thing. So that's kind of what I got out of Dion being there. Hopefully more people know about, you know, what it is or what, you're, what you get with the HBCU in terms of its funding, how big they are, the facilities. Because, again, they probably have upgraded in recent years. But, Ani, I remember I went to Coppin State uh, for, for Geico's in 2010. Yeah, 2010. And we were talking about it. And, and it's funny. At that time, they were really under, underfunded compared mm -hmm. to some of the facilities now. And it's like there's high schools in Texas that had nicer facilities than those colleges. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like to Dion to get where he's at now. And maybe the other schools can use that as a blueprint and help. So uh, do people want to kind of understand that or do they you think they're just totally missing the boat and, and, and just looking at Dion like, oh, you should have stayed like Chelsea said to be the savior for the next 10 years. It's like that's not realistic. I, I do think there are people that actually understand that because that's been an issue for funding with HBCU for years. Right. <laughs> um, but I think it's just finding a scapegoat. Yeah. And I think he just, he's just a scapegoat. They people know that HBCUs are heavily underfunded <laughs> and that, and that he is not to blame for them not being <laughs> underfunded. Funded. Right. It is, there's a mul there's multitude and, and, and there's been projects. I know people have been trying to figure stuff out for years on it, but I think people understand it's just Dion's escape go currently, but the real issue, that's what people don't really want to talk about right now. Correct. Understood. Chelsea, do you have the same sentiment? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And, you know, honestly, when I was coming out of high school, like it was a dream of mine to go to a HBCU. And sure. I say that because I just love black culture. I love being around black people. I felt like I would have joined a sorority, the Deltas. I'd be married and pregnant right now, you know. But the way it happens, I, I had to choose what I thought would be best for my career. And I knew sure. I wanted a career in basketball. And the basketball at HBCUs just wasn't up to par. And sure. it, it comes down to just the total package. Forget the facilities and stuff like that. Like just the publicity, the conferences, the competition. Right. Like yeah. if you have aspirations of being a professional athlete, that that's not the the you know the path that you really want to take <laughs> if you want to maximize your potential in actually you know achieving that dream of being a pro. And sure. so it's unfortunate that that's the situation, but I think that's what most people are thinking about. And so I think it's unfair for Dion because it's like, you guys only got five-star caliber recruits because of Dion. Right, there's right. literally no other reason. <laughs> He's like, there's right. no yeah. other reason because you don't have the money, you don't have the facilities, you don't have the funding. You really can't give me too much, you know, in NIL publicity. I have to pretty much do that on my own. Like, you know what, how Ani was just saying, some of these schools come with those packages. Hey, come right. here and we'll do this, this, and that. Is Jackson right. State really offering that? Or yeah. am I just riding Dion's coattails even as a player just to be here and be recognized? So oh, I, yeah. like I said, I think it's commendable, but it's just not realistic. So people have to, if it's about the kids and stuff like that, I don't think anybody is downplaying the type of education that you can get at these HBCUs, the, the sure. cultural aspect, how it's incredible for black people. But when it comes to athletics, it's not close. And everybody knows that. So I just don't understand why it's a Dion thing. But like Ani said, he's a scapegoat because it's convenient. It's but convenient. he did three years. And that's enough, truly. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at it, like you said, they have to be funded more. The population difference, I think people still forget, okay, if you got 13 or 14% of the African-American population in the country, how many of them go to college? That cuts it down another percentage. Like, and then the wealth. Their their family maybe doesn't have generational wealth, what we talked about before, compared to some other college graduates. Or, like, that's where the, it stems from. It has nothing to do. With, Dion has nothing to do with right. it's all, <laughs> right. Yeah, it, 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 and, and maybe he brought more awareness to that, and, and people need to to help. But I, I would like to see more people go to HBCUs. That would be awesome. You know, Absolutely. When I was in high school, um, some top recruits. I only know one guy like a football player. He was at Bakersfield High. His name's Steve Wolford. Uh, he went to Southern. He was supposed to go to Cal, but he had some grades issues or he had some of his credits didn't transfer. He, he might have been like maybe Prop 4080. So he went to Southern. And I followed him because he was a well, well-known well back. He was a running back. And, and I always thought, well, I wonder if he did as good as he would have went to Cal or transferred to Fresno State or something. But, like, he was really the only one that I can think of offhand. You know, most of the top recruits that were basketball recruits, they didn't they didn't really go to those schools. So I always think about that once in a while. And, and I know for uh, when when colleges weren't making a lot of money, especially in the 60s and 70s, tons of players went to HBCUs. They went to the NFL. Not basketball, but they went to the NFL. Tons. Mm -hmm. The whole draft was full of guys from Walter Payton. Sh Shannon Sharp. Yeah. 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 And I think Shannon Sharp had that issue, too where he was going to go to a big power five school and he had a grade, maybe one grade didn't transfer in, but an HBCU took him. So that that's kind of how you went to an HBCU as a big time athlete, as you said, Chelsea, in the eighties and nineties, maybe and even to the two thousands is, is maybe your grades weren't up to par. You had some kind of academic or admissions issue at a certain school. So you went there, but um, yeah, go, you know, kudos to Dion. I mean, he's brought a lot of attention. Hopefully he does well at Colorado. Uh, Colorado can win. They won a national title. Uh, Ani, we'll, we'll ask you one question and we'll move on to the next topic. When I, when I was a young kid, uh, Colorado started recruiting Neil McCarthy. He started recruiting California players and they won the 1990 national championship with pretty much like a California roster. Mm -hmm. Um, what's Dion's record going to be next year and how good can he be in two, let's say three years? Oh, that's a good question. I think he'll be. Well, they play 12 games, like yeah. seven and five. Seven and five? Okay. Five, if he's at 500, is a win. I can see him being, <laughs> you know. going to jump on him if he's at 500, I think. But <laughs> I mean, they okay. were 1-11. Like, I mean, I what they expect? Yeah. Like, I they should be happy to win four games, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I say in two years, yeah. you know, he'll get some high-level recruits. 
it's going to take time. It's in two, three years, you know. Maybe they'll be they can maybe crack a top twenty five, maybe one of those years, maybe at that third or fourth year. I just think it's it's gonna it's gonna take some time, man. Like, you know, they were bad. Like they were really bad. They were really bad. Yeah. But like even if you get again, we talked about you can't you get a bunch of five star high school recruits, that don't mean you're gonna, you know, go all of a sudden win nine to ten football games, you know. So I would say by third year probably when he'll get about nine to ten wins a season and you know, maybe if he stays in long enough, could you know have one of those special years? But it's going to take a minute. Yeah, I, Ronnie, I, I question saying. for you though. Yeah. So, what do you think about you know his little team meeting that he had the other day, and he, oh, yeah. you know, basically told the, the portal is open. You know, he tweets <laughs> every day. You know, Prime Coach Prime, not hard to find. Like yeah. he has opened up that portal. And what do yeah. you think in regards to the players that are there now? Are they going to remain, or you know, do you think? His roster is just, you know, two to three years from now, it's going to be pretty much all his guys if these guys are out of there. Yeah, I think, again, what coach has his first meeting recorded like that. So Dion adds that pressure. He can take it. I think he's telling, hey, guys, we need an upgrade. If if they were, like Ch- uh, Ani said, if they were seven and four, I don't think he could come in there with that attitude. But right. for him being, them being one and 11, he's like, you guys are on the – on the like firing block, like I, I don't need none of y'all. Like you're not maybe one guy's good because another, another kid did ask. He said, "What position coaches are you keeping?" He's like, "I'm gonna keep it real, dog. I don't think I'm keeping any of them." You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> <laughs> the kids are just like, you know, damn. So he's making it known, like, "Hey, we're gonna change this. Uh, maybe the winning culture. You guys haven't been winning lately. You know, we're gonna change the culture here." He's letting them know from the jump. I liked it. Maybe. The words could have been different, but I, I liked it overall. Just I thought, like, hey, he may he's like setting his tones, setting the law down, like he does. And I said, like, people have to take him serious. I think the players do take him seriously. They would like to play for him. It's just hard for like NFL fans and like older fans to be like, damn, Dion. That sounds like Dion, like, in the right. guy playing for the Falcons. You know what I mean? Like, but that's just how he is. You know, so he he commands the respect, and I think they are going to do good. I think they can go six and six wins or or. or even seven next year. I I just think he's going to completely turn it around. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know how long. I don't know if they'll get to, like, you know, playoffs ca- caliber. But the expectations oh, yeah. of Colorado are high. Only because they've won before. You know, like with Rick Neuheisel and, like I said, Coach McCarthy. They had really great players. They were, they were awesome to watch. So, the, so I think a lot of them are going to be gone, Chelsea. I, some of them are jumping. They're gonna. They're not coming. They're not gonna play. You're not gonna play. So why are you gonna stay? Get back to your point. So, if um, if I had a kid that yeah. uh, was playing at University of Colorado, I would tell him to transfer. Yeah. Like yeah. just, I I would be like, no, no, you're That's not right. gonna. Play. You're not gonna be your position coach. Didn't recruit you. Is not gonna be there. Yeah. Your coordinator's <laughs> not gonna be there. It, you know. I mean, how many starters be, they got though. back? Huh? Huh? But you got to compete. Like, yeah. if you feel right. like you like that, then you should be able to compete. Oh, uh, no, I'd be too realistic with mine. So I'd Honey, be like, if, oh. I start, <laughs> Honey, if I was a starting DV, like maybe a two year starter, I'd definitely be bad. Like, Coach Dion's going to coach me. I'm, I'm, I'm mom, I'm dad. I'm going to stay. I'm going to. Right, you know. right, right. But the right. average player's got to go. The average yeah. backup, he's not going to be playing because he probably couldn't play at Colorado anyway. He wasn't exactly. going to. You're one in 11. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it'd be very interesting to see. We'll, we'll, we'll obviously be following it, and hopefully Dion, uh, you know, turns it around. I'm sure he will. So let's let's jump into our main topic, which is the Raymond Lewis LA Legend documentary. There's a lot of things surrounding it. A lot of things have happened since our last pod that I wanted to we talk about. It kind of related to that. Obviously, uh, Kyrie Irving came back to play for the Nets, and now in the, in, in the last 48, 72 hours, he's been dropped by Nike. As a sponsor member, they suspended his account or his contract was coming up. And then uh, we also had Kanye West and, and we're talking about Kanye West. Not so much because, well, he's involved in, in youth basketball. You know, Donda Academy was around and now they're not around no more. And he made these off the wall comments and it just keeps getting worse and worse in terms of his comments, it seems like. But like he was connected to high school players. So like that's our bread and butter. So we got to talk about it. Um you know, Chelsea, you know, w- w- is Kyrie Irving just not being with Nike? Is that just kind of like you could see the writing on the wall? Or is it, do you think he got a fair shake? I know you don't think he got a fair shake as far as like all these uh, steps he had to take to get reinstated on the team. I know you thought that was BS, but how about him and Nike? 
I mean, I think the writing was on the wall, um, sure. honestly, just because of the climate of what's happening, especially with Kanye West and, you know, everything that's going on. But, you know, the interesting thing, like, I, I see that there's blame on both sides because sure. I feel like Kyrie, you know, kind of stirred the pot by posting something and not providing any context. That's sure. the only thing that I truly feel that Kyrie did wrong. If I'm going to post a swastika or a KKK mask or something and just a picture and not say anything, then yeah. you leave it for, up and for, you know, for interpretation. And, and I already said, you know, on one of our previous uh, pods that I, I don't have a problem with somebody soul searching. If sure. Kyrie feels like he needs to learn more about his background and his mother and his Native American ancestry and whatever, I, I feel like he has a right to do that. Especially we've talked previously about how, you know, some of the you know, cultural backgrounds and histories of, of minorities has been so watered down and whitewashed that sometimes you don't really know the, the true perspective sure. of, you know, where you've come from. So I have absolutely no problem with that. But I think when you are a brand and these basketball players and these people, Kanye, they are brands. They sure. are, you know, they have people that get behind them and support them and sponsor them. So you can't just use your platform as a free spirit, like you're just some Joe Schmo to post anything and not think that there's going to be any backlash. Sure. So that's the thing that's disappointing to me is that, you know, Kyrie's making these statements, Kanye's making these statements, and not that they're all even wrong, but, you know, the antics a lot of times outweigh the message. And I just feel like if Kyrie would have just provided some type of context, you know, I've watched this documentary, I don't agree with this, I do agree with this, but to just put nothing then it, it just caused chaos. That well, yeah. You have to expect that people are going to ask you about it. But then he didn't really want to answer when they were asking, but it's like... Well, he didn't know, really like, want to answer, yeah. Yeah, so I feel like sometimes you give Nike and these other, you know, these brands no choice because it's like, you're, you know, these are our consumers. We have to worry about, you know, the big picture. And if you're bringing us negative attention, then you got to go. So, yeah. you know, I think it's good for him because he's just in a place right now in his life where I just think he needs to not be tied to anything because he's still kind of, you know, figuring stuff out for himself. Um, I think it's exciting that, you know, John Morant and Devin Booker, I believe, are next in line to have a signature shoe. So that's going to be awesome. Um, but I don't like the way that, you know, the NBA handled Kyrie. And, and maybe it was even a little unfair on Nike's part, but but I definitely understand. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was, the writing was on the wall with him and Nike. Uh, sure. You know, you know how it goes. You get suspended, especially when it comes to these brands and stuff. Then you're going to get <laughs> uh, let go. I thought I agree with you. I thought the message, like you know, him even Kanye tried to portray the way they did it, it just didn't do a good job at it. You know, they could have yeah. done such a better job of you know uh, relaying how they're going to put their message together, where it could have done a lot more positive than the negative that it did. Um, because no one's actually listening to them, <laughs> you know, they're yeah. just, you know, just hearing all the crazy stuff. So, um, yeah, you saw the writing on the wall, you know, with brands like that, they're not going to do that. Kyrie's not like Brooklyn's Nets, not having a great season either. Kyrie's not right. doing like fantastic. So it was like, your Nike is like, what value? They kind of looking at what value are you really bringing? Cause your play's not, not yeah. he's like bad. It just, he's not. It's not like he's really averaging cool. 30 and Brooklyn's yeah. top three seed, you know, all that stuff. So I saw it. We saw it. Yeah. Come. And plus his contract was coming up. So what were they going to do? Renew it in these times? Like a long term? No. It might be they would have gave him a one year deal. They would have to renew his contract soon anyway because it was mm -hmm. up for renewal. So, yeah, it, it's timing and things like that. I, I agree with you guys. Um, and, and the reason I brought up the Kanye West thing is obviously his Twitter's account has been suspended now. But, you know, Ani, I'll ask you a question. Are, are, are parents and kids going to get it? Like, meaning, okay, look what happened with Donda. The, these kids have to scramble to find a new school. I don't, not even sure all of them found are playing right now at another place. Like, we know the high level guys are, but some of them felt they were left out in the cold. Uh, are they going to get it? They're like, hey, there's nothing wrong with working hard and staying at your high school or going to a prep school. This, 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 this obsession or, or, Want to be close to celebrity? Like, are we going to get it this time? Is or, or is it going to happen again? And the parents and kids are going to go to the next prep school and fall for the bells and whistles and, and it's going to fall apart? Or do you think like that's kind of we're moving past that and Kanye was the last straw with Donda? Uh, no, I think we're going to continue to be in, it's going to be the same thing. History is going to continue to repeat itself because there's going to be another celebrity that's going to promise 
X, X amount, or whatever, and right. they're going to be like, oh, it's not Donda because this guy said he's going to do this, and <laughs> and they're going to do this, and they actually, you know, yeah, we're going to do it's the same thing. Like, no one has learned from this. They're going to just go to the next best thing or the next, you know, the gra- they're going to think the grass is green on the other side. And that's just it. how, unfortunately, our business is. Yeah, it's just a business. So, yeah, you know, he obviously these kids are see a lot of money. They see celebrities, see status. And and when we talk about the, the Raymond Lewis doc, it's obviously about a doc about a great L.A. player. Um, and he got drafted into the 76ers in 1973. At that time, he was 20 years old. He was kind of an immature 20 years old. He uh, was the youngest player ever at that time drafted. The hardship had just went through uh, with Spencer Haywood being able to, you know, like to get drafted before four years out of college. And um, at that time, I think, Ani, the main thing that people won't, won't, should know, it's like at some point he knew his talent. People were approaching him, wanting things from him, wanting to do things for him because of his talent. And unfortunately, he knew that. And he had a lot of agents that wanted to represent him. Uh, you know, he represented himself for in most part in negotiations with the 76ers in 1973. It didn't go well, uh, it predictably. He didn't have a lot of leverage. I think he always thought, I can fix this. My talent will fix this. I could do what I want in high school. I could definitely do what I want at Cal State LA. He went to Cal State LA while he was recruited by other major colleges. And, and it didn't work out for him. He didn't play a game in the NBA. And I always thought, like, to hear about him growing up, and he's one of the greatest players ever from California. For me, the doc was always about, I want to see footage. I want to see this dude, how good he is. Well, it kind of changed over the last few years because it took so long to get it together, to find the footage. And we're going to talk with uh, our special guest soon about the doc, the, pro- the pro- two producers and the director of the film. We'll bring him on here in a little while. But, you know, what did you get- gather from the from the doc, Chelsea, just high line? And then Ani, we'll, we'll go to you. What you gathered from the doc? And again, it's, guys, it's the it's the Raymond Lewis Alley documentary. You, it it was premiering in late October, and it's on video on demand on your favorite, you know, VOD starting November first. So you can go watch it. Raymond Lewis Alley, a legend. Um, well, you know, just first impressions. I really enjoyed it. Um, I had no idea, you know, Ray Lewis is before my time. The only sure. Ray Lewis I knew of was the football player. Sure. Um, you know, prior to watching this documentary. So, you know, I definitely, as I started watching it, it was just very interesting to me. Um, you know, I, I found it incredibly sad, um, sad, especially kind of the way it ended, how so many players, notable players, NBA Hall of Famers, Michael Cooper, you know, all these people that are just speaking so highly of him as a player, and yeah. he never really got a true opportunity. And, yeah. you know, he loved basketball so much that even when it was all over and he ended up getting sick, um, needing to have maybe his leg amputated for some type of infection or whatever. Like he didn't want to do it because it meant that he wouldn't be able to go to the park and shoot around. Yeah. Like we're not even talking about like, yeah. you know, maybe him by the slim, slim, slim chance getting another side of the NBA. Like he just loved hoop so much that even right. when it was all said and done, like I still want to be able to go to the gym and shoot. And yeah. when things didn't pan out, just the depression the kind of losing his family, you know, his kids moved away to live with yeah. their aunt or something or grandma. And then the yeah. wife kind of left after two and, you know, just got kind of caught up on the streets and stuff like that, drug culture, all these different things. I just found it incredibly sad because I understand that journey, just being a player myself yeah. and just understanding and feeling like you don't always get a fair shake or, okay. you know, that you have this opportunity in front of you and you're not able to take advantage of it from whatever reason. So I I found it sad, but I do believe that there's obviously blame on, you know, on Ray's side, just because, you know, kind of being a little immature, like you spoke about, Ronnie, a little bit unaware of what's going on and thinking that you have the ability at 20 years old to come in and negotiate a contract. Yeah. Um, You know, if if, if you don't know what you don't know, and when people know you don't know, they're going to take advantage. And that's basically what happened with him. And, And we've seen terrible contract negotiations with people that were established in the league. Look at Scottie Pippen's terrible contract that he had in the last yeah, dance. Yeah. So yeah. what makes you think they're not going to take advantage of this kid? Oh, so, yeah. you know, he was very green. He had no idea. And he thought that his talent would trump everything. And yeah. although he still went from gym to gym, whooping on everybody, it just wasn't enough. And so gotcha. I was kind of sad by it. I, I found it very, um, 
informative, just, you know, learning about just LA hoop culture and the, sure. the role and the presence that he had. But I was saddened by the documentary overall. Gotcha. Ani, do you, what do you think? Yeah, I just thought it was a lot. Like, obviously, I was like, Chels, I didn't know anything about Ray Lewis uh, sure. before uh, uh, watching this. And I guess what I was looking at is, like, some of the parallels you see from, like, how his recruitment was. Obviously, you don't hear about kids getting – well, now you see guys with NIL deals getting cars, but, like, getting a Corvette, right? And, <laughs> and you know, going – like, just all the – yeah. How the how the recruiting was with him and how what and just like getting letting teachers do his homework and stuff. And you hear about that, you know, with players yeah. like the past couple in past, you know, and and during this time. So it was just it was just funny, just like, wow, like stuff really hasn't changed. Stuff <laughs> you really know? hasn't changed in 50 years. Yeah. Yeah, it just it was yeah. that was kind of crazy. But it was a lot of sad just, you know, hearing just him not even ever playing an NBA game, you yeah, know. Obviously, an NBA game. Yeah. obviously he 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 should, t- you know, he got to be held accountable for the, some of the moves he made. But you kind of look in the whole time, you know, when you hear guys like Antonio Brown and some of these guys that act a fool, like in today's game, you're like, man, who is who is advising? Who's guiding him? Like, where's his yeah. friends at? Who's telling yeah. him, hey, man, you need to stop doing this or yada, sure. yada, yada. Like, I just hate that. Like, when he was hooping, he was doing good. Everybody's on him, right? Yeah. And then when it starts just not looking a certain way, you know, there's nobody there. I always felt like, you know, where's who who's the person that's there to help him stay on the right track? I, you know, I just some of the stuff you see now, you see, you still see now to today. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of parallels. I wanted to kind of talk about this because I want to obviously help my friends get the doc out there. You know, people, I want people to watch it. Um, But I I thought there was a lot of parallels for what's going on to today. Kind of like the media taking a stance and the media was talking about how good this hotshot kid was in Philadelphia. Then, the, then the Sixers management kind of closed practices and then you don't hear too much about what's going on. You know, Doug Collins is the number one pick. Uh, Doug Collins was making, uh, you know, they call him like the, you know, he's making uh, $400,000 a year. So he's making seven figures in, in, in 1973. Uh, Ray was the, 18th pick of the draft, which was the last pick of the first round. He wasn't scheduled to make nearly as much, but then he, when he signed his contract, it wasn't even guaranteed. So at the end of the day, for a guy of his talent, again, he's a top three player in his class. He's a college All-American. Um, you know, he he didn't make really anything. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy at, at the end of the day. You know, he ended up getting a $25,000 signing bonus and made 50 k And then they told him to go home and mature up. He didn't even last. And then they brought him, they gave him 10K, I think, for returning to camp. And and that's basically it. He got the money of basically a third and he didn't even make $100,000 in basketball. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and he was still getting money from agents because the agents were telling him, hey, you know, we'll get you back in. We'll get you back in. Uh, I, when I saw the premiere, I saw the premiere. His daughter was there and she had her friends or her family there. Um, Dean Prater and Ryan Polimsky, who are who are the guests later on in our pod, they were there, and, and I known them for a while, and we've talked about the the, the documentary. And I wanted to get your guys' opinion. Um, one of them had said, uh, one of the the his daughters, one of her friends said, I think Gene Shu brought him back to the trial for the Clippers just to embarrass him again. Like I, I don't think he ever got a fair shot. I look at it exactly the opposite way. I think Gene Shu was like, hey, I don't want to be the guy on the hook the rest of my life to be like, I screwed this kid. I'm going to try to give him a shot with with the Clippers again. And to to, to clear my concept, be like, look, I'm trying to give him a shot. It just didn't work out. What do you guys think? Do you guys think after the initial 76ers trap that he really got a fair shot or that the fix was in and like he, people were not going to take him because of what happened? You want to answer on here, me? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll answer. Uh, I thought the writing – again, we talked about writing on wall. I, yeah. I didn't think he really got a fair shot. He would have to play completely out of his mind there. And I know he was even out playing Doug Collins early. But, like, yeah. I just thought they weren't going to take him. They just did it just – just like, hey, we're, we're, we can't – he can't say we didn't give him a shot, you know. <laughs> That's how I took it, you know. And, and especially how the league was even back then. It's, you know. Correct. Yeah, that's why. That's why I don't believe. Show they had the power. Like, hey, I don't care how good you are. You took your stance. We're going to show take our stance. Exactly. Chelsea, what do you think? Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Coach kind of just wanted to 
you know, let himself off the hook for the situation that happened. Yeah. Um, I just, I guess my biggest thing too, with him even being allowed to negotiate his own contract, which I think is ridiculous. Like you see now how stands are, how standards in contracts are in place. Sure. Like, okay, if you're a certain pick, you're going to get this amount of money minimum. Guaranteed. Yeah. Like, so at least times are changing that aspect. So I just feel it was so unfair because, you know, he was the 18th pick. So obviously he's not going to get the same amount of money as Doug Collins. That goes without saying. Yeah. But the contract in general was just crazy. Yeah. Like, and, and it, it would not happen today because sure. there's just so many rules in place to say, okay, a lottery pick is getting this no matter yeah. what. Guaranteed minimum, you're getting this. Uh, first rounder is getting this, you know, second rounder is getting this. So it, it was absolutely like unfair, you know, gotcha. but at the time, you know, they didn't have these regulations and he kind of thought he knew what he was doing. And so, you know, you, you can't disregard his part, but it, it, there were so many things that were just unfair in that documentary. And I think that's what made it sad because one thing that was undeniable was the talent. Like sure. nobody said that he couldn't play. Yeah. Yeah, none of the player, no nobody, no player came on and said, "Well, he wasn't that good." You know, he's a little overstated. Uh, yeah, that that makes sense. I, I, in my opinion, I think timing. Two things I saw, and it's parallel to Deion Sanders, is one in eleven, right? Colorado's one in eleven. Um, I don't think the players have much leverage. Like they're gonna have to jump on Deion. You know, like, hey, you're gonna have to work for your spot. If they were a bowl bound team, they say, "Hey, wait a minute, this dude's gonna come on and run everybody off." The 76ers were 9-73 and 73 the year before he got there. I don't think somebody pulled him aside and was like, yo, this is the worst team in basketball, the worst team in history. You saw the training camp. You guys saw the footage of the training camp. There's all these guys in there. It's like, Raymond, you got to make a, you know, your way and show something that, like, make your stance. You can't just assume they're going to open wall, open the door for you and throw the rose petals at your feet. Like, this team is terrible. You know, they're, they're, so that was one point. And I think the ABA, NBA war is kind of like, which team, which league is going to last? Mm -hmm. We want the good players. I think he got caught up in that too. But, you know, I, I think the 76ers should have just said, hey, you know what? We're going to cut you, not re-sign you. If you want to sign with the ABA, go ahead. But, you know, that that didn't happen. And they kind of kept him under wraps like he's our guy. You know, we, we, he belongs to the NBA. So I think he got caught up in those two things a little bit. But let, let's bring in Dean Prater, the uh, the co-producer and, and, and director of the, of the, of the Raymond Lewis doc, uh, Dean – we we'll bring him in now. Uh, Dean, how you doing? Ronnie Flores here. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing, Ronnie? I'm doing good. I'm here with my co-host, Chelsea and, and Ani, and talk to you a little bit about uh, the documentary. Uh, how, how's everything going? You know, it's been out now, quote unquote, to the world for a little over a month. You know, uh, how's it going so far? Just getting that and getting it out there. And I know you're proud and you're glad it's out there. And I just kind of wanted to get your high line take on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, everything's going well. You know, we still got have a lot of marketing to do. You know, we don't have a sure. giant marketing budget or anything. But sure. uh, uh, so far, so good. Uh, you know, we had people come out to the uh, premiere yes. uh, last October and had uh, a nice showing at the, at the premiere. And, uh, you know, it was a long time coming, Ronnie. You know, you yeah. know, back in the day, uh, see, I'm an older guy. I, uh, matter of fact, I just turned 68 on Saturday. But uh, in 1970, yeah, thank yeah. you. In 1971, I was a uh, sophomore at Dominguez High School in Compton. Sure. Raymond was a senior at Bourbon Day. Yes. So we even knew about Raymond then. Uh, he was considered a legend and a basketball phenom because yeah. no one had ever heard of Bourbon Day High School until they started winning these basketball championships and they started mm -hmm. talking about Raymond Lewis. So we knew about him even then. And, uh, you know, fast forward, he goes to college. Uh, <laughs> you know, here's a guy who had 250 college scholarship offers in high school at Reverend Day. It was that sure. good, 250. And uh, his coaches wanted to go, wanted him to go to schools like UCLA, USC, Notre Dame, that were high, profi high profile uh, 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 pro uh, basketball programs. Mm -hmm. Sure. Raymond ends up going to little known Cal State LA when a brand new Corvette magically shows up in his driveway. A brand new <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah. Um, he was slated. Raymond was actually going to go to Long Beach State. Sure. It was a good team at that time because they had, uh, that was before Jerry Tarkanian and uh, went to uh, UNLV. He was at Long yes. Beach State. And they were a powerhouse team. They were like uh, ranked top five, I think, the year that uh, in 71, 73, around that area. 
and Raymond was actually going to go to Alambia State because uh, he knew Tark. Sure. And they were they were close. Tark used to come down to the school, watch him play, and Tark was, you know, he knew his mom and everything. And Raymond had kind of committed to go to Long Beach State. And in fact, uh, over that summer of 71, Raymond's girlfriend and uh, Slash, uh, he, he married, he ended up being his wife. She ended up enrolling at Long Beach State. Yeah. And Raymond was going to follow her. And then Bob Miller, who's a friend of uh, Jerry Tarkanian, uh, kind of stole Raymond when he bought uh, when the school bought Raymond that car. And sure. so, so Raymond Raymond was all about Raymond was all about getting paid. You know, he hated the idea that you know the colleges could make so much money off of students and they couldn't they couldn't get anything. So he he hated that. Got it. But, Got it. Uh, so yeah, then um, you know y- years later, you know we didn't have any. There was no ESPN. We didn't have any. Sure. You know, of course, no social media or anything like that. So I kind of followed his career up until college. And then yep. I kind of wonder whatever happened to him. Well, it just so happens that uh, years later, I started working at a place called Certified Grocers, which is a food warehouse. And uh, one of Raymond's teammates, ex-teammates and friends also worked there. So he kind of filled me in on what happened between from the time that he left Cal State LA and uh, until I, I remember I remember the last time I had heard anything on Raymond before that, he was trying to make the, uh, I think at 29 years old, he was still trying to make the league. Sure. Uh, he was playing the summer pro league with the San Antonio Spurs and he averaged nearly 50 points a game <laughs> against, against highly regarded NBA players. Yeah. In fact, that was a game he scored 56 on Michael Cooper when Cooper was like defensive player of the year with the Lakers because they were playing against each other in, in that league. Uh, Coop said it was 67, but it was actually 56 that game. But the last game during that uh, that season, he did score 67 because I wow. remember 67 points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, and still, no one would touch him. Gotcha. Yeah. So so let let me ask you one question, and then we'll bring on Ryan, uh, you know, the director of the film. Dean, tell us what the moment you decided you wanted to make the Ray Lewin doc- documentary. What's what's the moment you decided you want to try to make this documentary and you started reaching out to people? What what year was that? Just take us through a little bit through that. In 2005, um, I started doing websites. Yeah. And years prior, I had been going down to Venice Beach and, you know, playing against the younger kids and telling them, you know, about Raymond. Sure. sure. I was like, well, let me let me do a, a, a create a documentary or a website. The website first. Let me create a website. Yeah. To where people can just go to read to the website and read about him. And at the same time, I said, well, look, I might as well do a documentary as well. So around 2005, and I talked to I must have over the next three or four years, I must have talked to over 200 different people about Raymond. And and and, and each story, you'd be on the phone for hours just talking about Raymond. It was sure. just that wow. and you learn th- a lot of things, you know, uh, throughout the filming and the interviews and everything. So. But that in 2005, that's when it, when it started. Okay, let me let's bring in Ryan Polimsky, uh, the director of the film. Ryan, oh, how, Ryan. Are doing? how are you doing? Good. 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 Appreciate you jumping on as well with Dean. We we got my co-host of the In the Paint podcast here, and we're just going to go back and forth and ask you guys a few questions. Uh, Dean kind of mentioned that he started thinking about seriously about the documentary in, in 2005. So we'll we'll just take it from there. Um, you know, go ahead, Ani, and you, you go ahead and and, and I, I will say this: before Ryan and I met up, I had went through like four different uh, filmmakers, and it, it just wasn't a good fit. Okay. So, right, until Ryan mm-hmm. uh, uh, got in contact with me, and we met, and and it just everything just started taking off since then. Gotcha. Uh, <clears throat> guys, talk about the time frame of gathering the assets, you know, to create the storyline, and did it kind of, did it change uh, during that process? But just talk about like just that time frame. Oh, uh, sure. I mean, our uh, our process of gathering assets ended um, started in 2013 and went to the very end of us making the movie in, in 2021. We were finding assets up until the very last minute um, uh, because of uh, some very pos- good luck and, and hard work. But I mean, that really was the sort of like the uh, biggest challenge in making this movie is finding photographs and finding game footage that showed Raymond and could bring this story to life because you know it happened 50 years ago and it was a time when there wasn't a lot of social media wasn't any social media you know very no video everything was shot on film so 
the media and the, and the content wasn't wasn't kept through history and the fact sure. that Randy didn't play at a big school um, and yeah. obviously didn't get into the NBA there was just such little amount of uh, evidence of his of his playing days so um, that really took us on a journey um, looking through coaches addicts and calling <laughs> players and going to different leagues and different yeah Brian's kind of breaking up a little bit. Yeah, we're kind of breaking up there a little yeah. bit, Ryan. But uh, you know, we got his point of that it, it it took a lot to to build those assets. Um, definitely. Uh, so we're we're cutting we're cutting out a little bit, Ryan. But it, it, we we get your point that it. it it was 50 years ago and there wasn't much footage of him and he never played in the NBA, obviously. Um, you know, so Dean did, how, how did the process change from just bringing his story to life? You know, did, did for you, did this, you wanted to get him out there as obviously he's a bad player. He's a really good player. You wanted that part out, but what changed over the years of like for the storyline, maybe just of, of current events that could have changed what you wanted people to know about Raymond. I don't think it. I don't think it changed that much. I, the only okay. idea I had was, look, I want. I wanted to chronicle his story. Sure. Uh, you know, show how great a basketball player he was. You know, on the West Coast, we don't have. Uh, uh, our, our street ballers aren't aren't chronicled like the like they are in Rucker Park. You know, we, sure. we, just don't, we don't we don't know how good our players were. Uh, but Raymond had a special story that I just wanted to tell. And I just wanted yeah. to make sure I wanted to in, introduce him to a whole new generation that had, had never heard of Raymond Lewis. Sure. Go ahead, uh, Chelsea. Is Dean back with us? I can't tell if he's frozen or not. Is he good? Oh, Ryan. Yeah, Ryan. Oh, Ryan, I'm sorry. Dean's good. Ryan, okay, I'm sorry about that. Ryan, can Ryan, you hear us? I can, can hear, hear you fine. Okay. Okay, perfect. I can hear you better. You were choppy a little bit, but you're back with us, so it's perfect. Okay. Um, I had a question for you, just you know, to piggyback on some of the stuff that you said. I was just curious to know when did you first hear about Raymond Lewis? And you know, you talked a little bit about the process and the time frame. I just want to know when you originally heard about him. Uh, when did you meet Dean and know that you kind of wanted to pursue completing this film with him? Well, I first. Uh really learned about Raymond when I moved to Los Angeles in 2013. Uh, and I came across Dean's website. And I had been researching another basketball story at the time. Uh, the idea that that uh, a lot of the Central City teams were now dispersed and were playing in private schools. And it was sure. sort of like had hollowed out the basketball culture of, of inner cities, especially Los Angeles. And while I was researching that, um, I came across the uh, Dean's website and and, and, and Raymond and it triggered something in my brain because I'm originally from Philadelphia and uh, I grew up uh, you know reading old Sports Illustrated uh, magazines and I vaguely remembered Raymond's story sort of in the uh, in the folklore of Philadelphia sports history. So when I read Raymond's website, it triggered something in me. Um, it, it, it spoke to me. It, it, it felt like it was a question that needed to be answered. And it was a good way for me to really sort of uh, entrench myself and embrace myself in Los Angeles, was, which was my new home. Mm -hmm. So as a documentarian, you know, I like to connect to um, communities. Uh, I like to build communities. And the scene project could have a lot of benefits, um, not rather than just the movie itself. So. That's how I got involved in the story. I like that. Got it. So, so Dean, this is 2005. You, you, you've known about Raymond your whole life, pretty much your basketball playing career. And um, you wanted to get it out there. Obviously, getting footage of him in high school is a chore. I, I know that because I would love to see it. I've always would have loved to see it if there was no documentary. And um, at any point in this documentary, because you can do a little YouTube feed, uh you know, YouTube story on him. You could write up something on his website. Did you ever think like at some point, like, wait a minute, this is not going to get where I want it to. Did you ever think, Hey, you know, I, it's not going to be a full length feature film. Uh, maybe I could just put something out on them. Uh, tell us about that. And then tell us how things changed when you finally found that coveted footage of, of, of him playing at Cal state and him playing at Verbum day. Yeah. Well, you know, I, um, I, I, I felt, 
that uh, no matter what, I was going to get do some put something together on Raymond. Sure. Whether it was a short film or just something on YouTube or or, or, or anything, but my main objective was to uh, do a, a, a full film on Raymond, a feature film on Raymond. Sure. Uh, so and it's funny how things work out because we had started with a, uh, a Kickstarter uh, campaign in I think around 2014. Sure. And we had the the, uh, the goal set at a specific amount, which we didn't raise. And in, in hindsight, that turned out to be a good thing because if we would have got all the money we needed to do the film then, then some of the footage that's in the Raymond Lewis film now we would not have had. You would not have had uh, with him uh, with him and Brian Gumble in '73. Some of the footage that uh, of him at, at the Sixers camp, we probably yeah. would have done to finish the film before then, before we had a chance to find that extra footage. Gotcha. So it was. Uh, it took forever, but I just kept, you know, chugging along, chugging along. And uh, when Ryan, Ryan and I hooked up, uh, it was slow but steady. Mm-hmm. And then when Got we it. had about uh, 20, let's say, interviews in the can with Michael Cooper and uh, Jerry Tarkanian and some of the guys that played in the league, Lorenzo Romar, uh, we just figured once we got to that point, and Sonny Vaccaro too, we, we figured once we got to that point that, uh, you know, someone would just jump in and, and finish sponsor us and, and to get the film done, but it, it just never happened that way. You know, but we, Ron and I pretty much uh, at that to that point, we had uh, financed the film ourselves, but we just kept going and kept going. And then for, finally, we first got we got that first break with uh, Dr. Samad at Cal State LA. I'm a Cal State uh, Dominguez Hills. Got you. Got you. Got you. Um, um, just talk about, you know, you finally got the, the, the footage, like Ronnie talked about, like we talked about in the game, but in the, the footage and just to picture everything. Uh, what incident or interview made you realize, like, okay, you know, this is really what we want to really talk like this is how we're going to really paint the story. Um, you know, what what interview incident just happened that's like, yeah, this is it. Well, for me, you know, interestingly enough, it was our first interviews that were the most important. Okay. The very first two interviews, uh, one was with, it was uh, in Caldwell Black's house. And we interviewed Caldwell Black, who was a longtime coach here in Los Angeles, uh, high school and, and college coach, kind of a coaching icon. And he was also Raymond's junior high coach and varsity coach for one year. And then uh, his childhood teammate, friend, uh, Adrian Trivers. So we sat down there for about five, six, seven hours one day in Caldwell's house, I remember. And it was about this time of year. How many times? Nine years ago. And they just told us the story from their heart. You know, they told us the Raymond Lewis story. They were the ones that knew the best. And uh, from that point on, you know, we knew we had a special story that hadn't been told yet. Um, It was just a matter of putting all the pieces together. And, you know, when I ended up editing the film six, seven, eight years later, uh, you know, I would all go back to Adrian and Caldwell's interview most frequently. They were like the, the backbone of the film for me. So, um, yeah, interestingly enough, you know. Gotcha. I don't happen to Dean, but. Yeah, I think Dean can still hear us. Dean, can you still hear us? Yeah, I, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear yeah. you. I don't know if you're, we lost your video, but if you can get the video feed, you know, but if not, you can still hear us. That's great. Um, okay. I don't know why the video. You might have hit something. Maybe I could bring you back on. You know what? I'll, I'll I'll remove you, and then you can come back on with the same link. Okay. Okay. I'll remove you real quick. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, Ryan. You know, uh, this is just my opinion. I feel the interviews with Pat Williams really made the doc because we're mm-hmm. if you're watching the doc by yourself, um, you know, you're watching the doc by yourself, which I did, and and so did Chelsea and Ani. Um, you know, but when you're watching the doc with people that know Raymond or people that are, have vested interest in his story, like we did at the premiere, when Pat Williams speaks, it's like, they're gasping. Oh my God. When he said that, you know, that kind of, when he said, you know, Raymond's our guy, he's our property. We're not giving him up. We're not trading him. We're not cutting him. That kind of made people kind of understand the ethos of the time in, in, in that time in the, in the early seventies, you know, um, what, what interview did you learn the most from him about this story? Uh, Oh. Well, I'm, well, go uh, ahead, Dean. Go ahead, Dean. Because Ryan's getting cut off here. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, 
Well, we learned, we learned a lot of stuff, but so we couldn't put the documentary. But anyway, uh, what I learned here is that Robert was Sonny uh, Macaro. I didn't know he, uh, Sonny had tried to get him a, uh, yeah, in, the, uh, with, with, in the 80s uh, with, with the Condors. And I, I didn't know that. And that was when the high school, he asked me, he had a, a friend had a chance to sign with the uh, with, with Pittsburgh, and uh, but he did because he he was there and he gets enough money to cows to play, uh, and he was really wanted to be in the NBA. Gotcha. So you 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 learned a lot mostly from Sonny's interview, just about like some well, history about him. Years <clears throat> years before I did the uh, uh, I was thinking about doing a documentary. I learned everything. Eddie anyway, Williams was also in the uh, documentary film. Because sure. he was a friend of Raymond's, and uh, he actually played with Raymond for Urban Day. So yeah. I, what I learned, I learned everything, everything from Eddie Williams. Uh, in fact, I learned that uh, Raymond's not going to contract with Philadelphia. He didn't have proper rep representation. He didn't have an agent or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So he let, who lets a 19, 20 year old kid negotiate their own contract? Yeah, I understand. Go ahead, Chelsea. So, Dean, uh, what did you want the impact of Raymond's story to be in 2005 compared to what you think the impact is now? How do you think, you know, you were able to kind of maybe change the narrative if there was one at all? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I just wanted to tell the story. That's all. Uh, Chronicle is history. Uh, you, you know, the, the game has changed so much since uh, Raymond played. But, uh, you know, it's... I just wanted to tell the story. That's basically it. Gotcha. And Ryan, if you can hear us, well, you know, what what did you want to, you know, the impact of this to be? Do you think it's changed over the years? Just the stuff that's happened with whether it's um, you know, with Colin Kaepernick, what he's been through, all the things we've been through through COVID. Has that changed the scope of the documentary, or you think the, the gist of it is still the Raymond's incredible story and the pitfalls of it and maybe some of the triumphs of it? Well, the I would say, if you can hear me, can you hear me okay, Yeah, we Ryan? can hear you. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. I would say that you're asking what the gist of the story is? Yes, and if that's changed over the years from when you first heard about it. I would say no. I would say that, you know, Raymond's story is sort of uh, – you know, sort of an eternal story and sort of locked in time. Sure. You know, it's not something that could happen today. Um, the, 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 there's elements that could happen to some athletes, but what happened to him was ex extremely, you know, historically unique. Um, you know, it, it couldn't happen any other time. And therefore, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of like a, a classic legend. Sure. And, and a timeless story that I think will, you know, be able to be, listened to and, and enjoyed and, and learned from for, you know, for years. I don't think it's, it's like a topical story. And, um, uh, but I hope that, um, you know, the lessons are, 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 are long lasting for those that can check it out. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you give us, I have one more question, either one you can a answer it, you know, um, like as far as, as the, the documentary goes, do you think there's obviously some negligence there? And Raymond made some mistakes. Do you, do you think the 76ers and or the NBA should do something for his family or, or honor him some kind of way? Say, hey, this was a wrong thing. You know, the, the, the NBA has helped out ABA players who've come on hard times. Do you think the NBA should do something or do you think it's more of a, hey, this is what happened and you guys should know about it and hopefully history doesn't repeat itself? Or, or do you really feel that the NBA should do something for him? And either one of you can answer. Well, I'll start by it was such a long time ago. I it, it's a thing. <clears throat> I still have some people saying well, you, <clears throat> that you have some people saying that uh, you know just paid out the year at the Philadelphia and we renegotiate and things were getting a lot different. Um, but then you also had the age at that time. So it was it, 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 it's hard to say. Um, the end people from the Philadelphia organization will have to look at the film and you know, that's all to decide if uh, they want to do something of the you know, that would kind of, you know, correct the situation or not. Sure. I, I, I might have been long ago, him not playing it for me. So. 
Got you. And Ryan, if you can hear, uh, you know, and if you have some 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 thoughts on that as well. Well, I, I'm a little. I have a little bit of a different opinion than Dean. Uh, you know, I do think that the NBA and NCAA, uh, you know, does need to mm-hmm. recognize Raymond's contributions. Okay. Uh, you know, I I think he deserve belongs in the conversation of being the NCAA Hall of Fame. And I think that the, you know, the NBA, specifically the Sixers, should acknowledge what happened. Because I think, you know, if you drill down into what happened with Raymond, which we do in a documentary. Yeah. You know, the 76ers, I think, really overstepped their bounds Mm -hmm. uh, with the contract. You know, it's one thing to say, you know, a guy signed a bad contract and he was due and he he had to oblige by it. But, you know, they went out of their way into another business to keep him from playing. Sure. Uh, which really, you know, torpedoed his whole career. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, are they, I think that they owe something. What What that is, I don't know. Sure. But, uh, I mean, I, I, I want the NBA, I want the Sixers and NBA to acknowledge that what they did with Raymond was not right. Um, and, and, you know, they can come up, maybe the Players Association and Raymond's family, and they can work together to come up with some sort of plan to, you know, recognize that and put him in the, you know, put him in the history books as somebody that, you know, sure. you know, it's not it really was no fault of his own really. I mean, when it comes down to it, um, you know, it's not somebody that, that scuttered his career, you know, um, with, so, that, you know, that, that kept him from greatness. It was really a, an act of, um, by the Sixers, you know, uh, of, um negligence or i don't know if that's the right word but um so yeah i do so i hope so we're gonna we're gonna take the film to philadelphia a couple months uh we're gonna hopefully make some noise out there and get philadelphia talking about it and hopefully the sixers will come out and 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 join in the conversation and you know we can to you know move move all these discussions forward um, you know, not just Raymond, but a lot of other people that I think need to be recognized that have been like, overlooked uh, when it comes to creating the game that we have today. Gotcha. Uh, let people know where they can watch the documentary and we'll let you guys go. Ryan, if you could let people know where they can watch the documentary. Or the documentary. Yeah, you, you can go to the website, and, uh, but it's on iTunes, uh, Google Play, and and numerous of uh, numerous, uh, platforms. Gotcha. So the, it's on iTunes. It's on iTunes, Google yeah. Play. And and the website as well, RaymondLewis.com, basically. Yeah. And I want to put a challenge out there as well. Uh, Raymond's president of Yale. <laughs> he made 30 out of 40 shots for 73 points. Now, keep in mind, every time he pulled the three point shot, he's not entering into the game of basketball in the NBA or in college. It wasn't the NBA, but the NBA. So he made 73 points, 30 out, 3 shots, 75 percent. And I'd like to put it out there that we can find another guard that's shot 75 percent, 40 shots. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That's it. Was the Stephen Curry of my generation, or dare I say, Stephen Curry, Raymond Lewis, his generation. So sure. Raymond was not good of a shooter. He was, he was awesome. Yeah. And I think the, the footage shows a little bit of that. Right. Uh, you know, it, it shows he's a good player. That's kind of what we wanted to see. And and, and I know you're humble about it. But, yeah, I, I think the 76ers at least should acknowledge him. Or, or I just think they will. Uh, yeah. Or, or maybe they can start a scholarship fund in his name. Something they can do for him, you know. Weird. Yeah. I so, see that. Yeah. So hopefully you guys, oh, good luck in, in getting it out there in Philadelphia. I know you've gone to different stops, Cleveland. And things like that. And we appreciate your time. Tell Ryan, thank you. I know we had a little bit of, of audio and technical difficulties, but we got the gist of it. We, thank you, Dean. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean. Take care. All right. Wow. You know, I know Ryan got cut off, but I, I found his perspective interesting about what he thinks that the Sixers should do something about kind of the negligence. And Thinking about it, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about how there's standards in place now for these things not to happen. So I feel like that, you know, alone kind of shows that the fault of the organization. I still think that, you know, uh, Ray Lou jumped the gun with his decision to, you know, kind of just represent himself. But at the same time, it's like now you see all these things in place that the players just have to get as as a first round pick. 
he, he, he definitely was deprived of it. And I didn't really think about, you know, I knew it happened because I watched the documentary, but just Ryan yeah. mentioning how he was blocked from the ABA too. Like you stopped this man from working in another, another profession you know, for another employer. And then his life just kind of spiraled from there. So I do think that there's responsibility and definitely blame on the Sixers part. I, I really highly doubt that they do anything about it. Sure. Um, but maybe with a little bit of, you know, public scrutiny when this documentary yeah. comes out, it's about to hit Philadelphia that people will say, okay, you know, the Sixers organization was wrong. Yeah. And and that's kind of what we're bringing it up for is to, and talking about all this documentary, not just to get it out there. And I know some of our listeners know a little bit about Raymond, especially our West coast listeners. We appreciate everybody tuning in. It's, it's, to, to hopefully grow that and people to learn from that and say, wow, right. what the NBA was like. That's kind of what this story is about to me. And it isn't all peaches and cream. Like guys are making guaranteed contracts at, at you know, rookies are now in the mid, mid at Raymond's pick is 18. So the 18th pick in the draft is a uh, day Terry this year, right? Obviously there's more teams. So he's not the last pick. He's making a four year, $15 million deal. You know, so he's on a four year, $15 million deal and he doesn't really play that much for the Bulls, if at all. So it's just a drawing some parallels there, like of what these guys, um, you know, how much better it is now, how much more guaranteed it is now. Uh, yeah, obviously, but- Raymond made some mistakes, but it's to your point, Jesse, you know, uh, I do agree that there's some negligence. They could pull him aside and say, listen, kid, you're making a big mistake here. Let's go back to the drawing board, get some representation, come back and, and we'll help you out with this. We'll, why not try to take care of an asset you drafted? That's what I, I don't understand. Yeah, and I think I'm just curious too now that you know we're talking about it. What would be a comparable contract for the 18th pick of the previous draft or the draft after? Like I'm curious yeah. to know where his contract falls in line with you know similar draft classes. Texas. You know what I'm right. saying? Like because it just seems like the contract in general was just BS. But I'm very interested to see you know what these people that were in his position the year after. You know, Michael Cooper came. Um, a couple years later, like obviously he was a higher draft pick, but just, you know, let, let's look at the comparables there and maybe that will tell you, you know, some, something, you some know, data. yeah, it wasn't a very good contract. It wasn't written in his favor. That's for sure. And I think they took advantage of him again. The NBA teams weren't making as much money, so they didn't care if, a, if, a, if somebody wasn't, uh, you know, up, if they didn't have good representation. Yeah. The, 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 the organization was going to, put things in their favor so right. i think that was in a lot of sports and a lot of things uh, obviously doug Collins being the number one pick they thought he was going to be the face of the franchise and, and, and i think the documentary should have made note that regardless of what you want to say about coach shu he was known as a good coach and pat mm-hmm. williams is a is a good gm guy pat williams was starting to look at high school players like he was ahead of the game mm-hmm. he, sorry he, they drafted daryl dawkins and that franchise became a good team. By the time Raymond was done, 1975, they were much better. They had World Be Free. They were a much better team. So they were headed on the right direction. I think the doc should have made note of that, that the Sixers, once the ABA folded, got Dr. J, and they were in the NBA Finals. So Raymond would have been, what, 1977? He would have been about 26. He would have been close to his prime. Where would he have fit in? Would, would he have been a starting asset? They obviously had Henry Bibby. They had George McGinnis. They were a good team. Where right. would Raymond fit in? And, and I think they won the championship in 1983. Uh, Doc, they brought in Moses Malone from Houston, and Moses was like the, the the final piece of the puzzle. There was great teams in in the East at that time with Milwaukee and with with Larry Bird in Boston, and they finally got over the hump and won it. But they were in the finals three out of four years. And and in in 1983, Raymond would have been 31 years old. So where would that have been? You know, obviously 31 then is not what 31 is now. He probably would have been closer to the end, but he'd have been in the try. Would he have been a role player? Would he have been a starter? You know, I think something should have been mentioned of that, that the Sixers and the NBA moved on without him, and that's the part he didn't get. The, The train was going. I think that one guy did mention the train was going down the track. Going to this money train towards toward uh, Magic and Larry Bird and, and Raymond guy wasn't on the train. Right. But just what about the lack of, you know, yeah. renegotiating the contract in good faith, which is what he believed was going to happen. Sure. It's like, I, I really don't, I, I think you can hypothetical like any situation, sure. but in his mind, I'm going to get a new contract if I yeah. do this, this, and this. Yeah. And he did that. He went to camp and he performed. 
<laughs> and so, you know, they never promised that they would give him Doug Collins contract, but no. you're giving me a new contract. Like you, you didn't even, you know, stand by what you told me we, we would do. Maybe the contract would only left him with 75,000 guaranteed. Who knows? It could have been some BS too, but you didn't even do that, which no. I felt is where it was so deceiving. Like, yeah. and I can see how, you know, how it would affect a player or a person just mentally, you know, working as hard as they can and already feeling like you're, I'm better than what you have. And yeah. you looked me in the eye and told me that, you know, we would renegotiate and then we never did it. Yeah. Sucks. What, what do you think, Ani, is the, the, going to be the lasting thing? It's, it's just like, tail, learn from that? Or do you think, like, uh, obviously you know more about a player that's kind of a, a lost player in time, but what do you think is going to be the final takeaway for you and for most people? Uh, just, you know, for me, it was kind of just having – I think from his time in Cal State, decision yeah. there, the stuff going on there, you can kind of see what was about to happen in him and yeah. NBA. And even though there are things he couldn't control and he got screwed, I do feel like the some one of the biggest takeaways is like got like when you got guys that are projected to be pros and whatever, whatever. It just takes one, two wrong moves or <clears throat> misdirection here, and yeah. your life can be all jacked up. You know, we, yeah. we, we see it a lot in our, uh, you know, you know, on the West Coast, me at down south, we see this a lot. Um, yeah. And that's just one of those things of having the right people around you, making the right decisions. It's important. Decisions he made at 17, 18, 19 years old kind of affected him, <laughs> you know, when he got to the league. Uh, unfortunately, and I just think that was his biggest takeaway. It just like if he just has the right people around him, this would never have happened. Correct. You know, that that's how I that's how I took it. And that, I think that's important for young players today that are getting so much thrown at them. Like, make sure you have the right people around you, you Correct. know, because so, you can make some money now. And then, you know, it just takes a really, you know, like Chelsea, him being his own agent. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. you know, that was such a bad move. But like it takes something like that. Then now the trajectory just changes completely. No doubt. No doubt. And yeah, for me, I think it's along your lines. Uh, Ani is uh, the decisions. We talk about kids decisions a lot and of talented players, parental decisions. And and what the doc doesn't say and some of the rules that were in place is I think he personally thought him being naive a little bit of Chelsea said a little green and kind of to himself a little quiet. He didn't want to do a lot of interviews and he was a little reluctant to trust people is I thought he can take. He thought he can take the car and take the money and still go to, to Long Beach State with Tark. Yeah. But once he enrolled at summer school, at Cal State LA, he was done. He had by NCAA rules, he had to go there. He was already on his eligibility clock. I personally thought he could still go to Long Beach State because his, he had his dorm room over there, he had his girlfriend over there, and he had his. <laughs> he thought he could get it on both sides. You know what I mean? Like right. He, his girlfriend's going to Long Beach because Tark is smart. Tark's like. Oh, you want to bring your girlfriend? No doubt. We got a scholarship for her. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. She's in. Like, he thought, oh, this is all going to work out. I can take a car of it. Like, no, it, it didn't work out that way. And he still balled. He, like right. Dean said, he still balled. That, that wasn't the problem. You know, he, he he still really balled. And they actually beat Long Beach State. You know, he scored 53 in a game. And uh, just as far as his game, I, I always try to tell people, like, and, and I've seen the footage and people are telling me, like, you would have to be a really hell of a player to be as good as him. Just without like a trainer and all, like that guy was so smooth. His jumper was so good. Uh, you know how good it would have been. I don't know. I think he's kind of a Paul Bunyan guy now in LA. To be honest, right. he's always going to be the the guy that's going to be number one. Like that, people are going to want to look up to in terms of a legend. He's going right. to be the legend because he didn't make it. I don't know. Again, what would he have been in the NBA, Chelsea? Ani, you know, five time All Star. There's yeah. no telling, you know. Right. But that wouldn't have been – he wouldn't have been Magic Johnson. You know, he wouldn't have been – so his his status is based on a little bit of that mystery, and I still think he is a mystery, to be honest, a little bit. He's still a little bit of a mystery, even though now his story's out there. Like, what really happened in those contract negotiations? I mean, Gene Shu put it out there, and Pat Williams is just straight up – he ain't going to get it. Like, he was going to be in our favor. So very interesting the comparisons of now. And we hope that doesn't happen to a player. But I, I guess to your point, Ani, um, nothing's guaranteed. You know, we've seen it in other documentaries. Uh, nothing's guaranteed. It, it, it is sad, Chelsea, to your point, 
and to your bigger point, it is a, a sad story. Hopefully there's some good ending. E even his uh, daughter, Camilla Lewis, who, who I've got to know a little bit, and, and she was at the premiere, and she's like, I didn't know some of this stuff about my dad, you know? And, and, and I, ho I see that he's done it wrong. And she comes from a little bit of emotion behind it. You know, she wishes things went different. But um, we'll see what happens in terms of, like the NBA acknowledging it. The NBA has acknowledged some of the ABA players. And, and there's even been some notes like that the people feel the NBA is waiting for the ABA players all to basically pass away so they don't have to give them anything, you know. But mm. trying to make some 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 amends to that, I, I don't know what the right thing would be here to do. Maybe to formally acknowledge him or maybe set up a scholarship for a player right. at a school in his name or something like that would be, would be commendable. Obviously the Sixers have the money to do that. <laughs> you know, they can, they can do whatever they want, whether they do nothing or not. So, um, you know, do, did you guys, and Chelsea, I'll start, do you draw any parallels from like what people are going through today? The, you know, the, the media talking about Raymond, he's a great player. Then the Sixers shutting it down to, to some of the media things that the players are going through today, uh, you know, I'll start with you, Chelsea. Is there any parallels or is just Raymond a unique story in time? I, I don't think it's unique, but I think, you know, just my biggest takeaway was just don't ever think it can't happen to you. I mean, we've seen instances and even players that weren't as good as Raymond, Colin Kaepernick, yeah. you know, him being blackballed for taking a stance on something that he yeah. believed in. Like we've seen, different instances of this. And I think it just goes to show like, it doesn't matter how good you are or, you know, you know what your capabilities are, you know, that will make you last in a league longer. But if somebody wants to get rid of you or make a point by you, you know, they, 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 they have the ability to do that. Sure. So I, I, I definitely see, you know, him as maybe being an interesting case and maybe one of the, the first cases of, you know, his maybe type just, you know, never actually getting a chance to play and kind of yeah. dying from, you know, not fulfilling his dream. Sure. But we definitely see other instances in sports where, you know, certain things could definitely just keep you away from the game that you love. And, and it's unfortunate. So um, that was just the biggest thing for me. Like I said, I felt sadness, um, but but I understood, you know, kind of what happened and how, the role that he played as well. Sure. Yeah, I definitely see parallels. You even, uh, you know, reading the DeMarcus uh, Cousins, obviously he's played long in the league, yeah. but, you know, he asked uh, Bob Meyer, like, you know, why can't I be on the NBA team? They say they don't know, like, you know, they talk about his attitude. There's there's guys, you know, in the league that can't get in because of <laughs> that basically blackball because of, they say, questionable character or whatever, whatever, yeah. and their talent. You know, they could help a team. They can get in the rotation. I'm not saying they're a starter, but, like, maybe a seven, eighth, or ninth guy that should be in the NBA, but they're blackballed. You know, it's like back ball. I think about Mike Beasley. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Uh, well, obviously, Royce White's a little bit different, but, you know, even when he was like when he was trying to get better and get back going, some of the same stuff. So you see it. You, you, you do see it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I could definitely see where the NBA again. It's timing for Raymond. He went to a terrible team. The, uh, the Sixers weren't going to let him go to the to the stars in the ABA and just let him rock. <laughs> and get nothing out of it. I, right. I, I could definitely see that. So he was hurt by that, by you know them being a two leagues and fighting over players and and, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, you know, I, I agree with you guys in terms of like you know nothing's guaranteed. Uh, I, I got out of it that you you can't always outsmart things. Uh, you know, he would have made some pretty good money if he would have lasted till his early thirties. Again, players don't didn't play as long as they do now. He would have made, you know, 400000 a year, 500000 He would have lived a pretty good life, even if he played to, like, 32, and the Sixers right. were good. It's always a what if. Uh, uh, his talent's undeniable, um, and it's a great story just to learn a little bit about the history, especially for people that don't know about, about his story that even got drafted mm -hmm. or even played. But, right. yeah, he was a great college player, and maybe hopefully one day he gets in, into the College Hall of Fame. And, and I've always published stories. I've always talked about him being a playground legend. You know, when we did the Elite 24 out in L.A., it was natural for me to name one of the teams, the Raymond Lewis team. Uh, I always wanted to do that. It came out on TV. It was on ESPN. The, the announcers talked about it. And even if it was just for a couple of minutes, a little bit more people got to know his name. And the other team was Marcus Johnson team. We just I just named him Raymond Lewis Red and Marcus Johnson Blue or whatever we did at the time. Again, this is from 2010 to 2012. And people were starting to learn about a story then. But, like, really, I, I heard from Dean a long time ago. Uh, uh, I was like, Dean, don't give up. There's footage of him in high school. You, I just don't think the story without the footage, he might have put a little something out there, but it just wouldn't have got out there. You know, right. it, it would just be this yeah. 
he needed the game footage and now they have a full feature film that's good enough to 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 watch you know online and, and pay your nine dollars or whatever it is to cost uh so i would recommend people who are listening to this pod to go definitely go watch it uh hopefully you learn something it's great for if you have a young player now to learn some of the pitfalls and, and just some of the business dealings of what the nba is and the nba is making a ton of money you could see that they were on the way to do that, especially when the ABA folded. It's kind of like mm-hmm. they brought in Dr. J. Dr. J came to the Sixers, and they were well mm-hmm. on their way to the to the uh, you know the salaries rising, and, and and they just went crazy. You know they've gone crazy, and it's such a successful league. And you feel kind of bad that, that he didn't get any any piece of that because he obviously <sighs> was good enough. And 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 I I like Sonny Vaccaro what he said too about you know he thought. Oh, the Sixers are full of it a bit, and he tried to help them go to the ABA, but it it, it just didn't work out. So, uh, again, check that Raymond Lewis story out. Um, you know, uh, LA legend. It's it's all over uh, video on demand. Uh, you know, we're gonna wrap up here. Uh, you know, next week we'll have we'll probably one more pot, and then we we we're getting into these tournaments, so we probably won't come back to the New Year. So, uh, mm-hmm. Ani, just talk a little bit about that. Where you're gonna go, and and we we now know Tark is. NBA certified, uh, who Paul is going to be NBA certified and, and Geico at the end of the season will NBA certified. Talk a little bit about that and just what your plans are for the next couple of weeks as we're heading in here to the holiday into the new year. Well, just, it, you know, talk about, you know, talk being NBA certified and these events are, um, yeah. you know, just talks about how, you know, the NBA is really trying to figure out the high school level. All right. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. And just, you know, it's important for them to, figure like have a have names on a list and you know then starting gathering intel early so um you know the nba is kind of they're look they're looking back into the high school realm uh yeah. more uh i'll be at memphis uh for the iverson classic and then uh i'll be at tark uh later yeah. in the month and then i gotta figure out what i'm gonna do towards the end of the year after uh yeah. yeah after christmas but uh i'll be traveling somewhere so i'll be making my rounds yeah. yeah, yeah, me me as well. I'm going to go to Hoop Hall West here in the next few days. That's in Phoenix from December 8th through the 10th. Duncanville will be there. Cardinal Hayes, Wasatch, uh, Legacy mm-hmm. Early. We'll see uh, Coa Pete Perry will be there. St. Mary's of Phoenix. It'd be just a smorgasbord of showcase games. And you're right. Uh, I, I Just if you look at a guy like Shaden Sharp, if you could look at even uh, some of the other guys that maybe had an injury in college, the NBA feels they didn't get a good look at them. Uh, Darius Garland, mm-hmm. you know, so they're, they're, they're opening it back up a little bit. It's pretty interesting. We talk about Raymond and, and how the AB was going to offer him a contract yeah. straight out of high school. And, and, and to the Sixers credit, you know, they drafted a high school guy, Daryl Dawkins in 75. Uh-huh. You know, he was the fifth pick. He was a contributor and, and they were kind of in the front running. They did some good jobs. They obviously Scott, I mean, taking Raymond at that pick was a steal in terms of talent. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I mean, right, negotiations didn't work out, but they did a good job. Like, they did a good job drafting and obviously getting uh, Doc, you know, over from basically the, the, the Nets had to give him up to enter the M- NBA was basically what it, what it was. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be wide open. I think we're, like Ani said at the top of the show, there's going to be a lot of t- hot top teams losing and, and, and dropping and another team going to number two, then maybe this team number one. But I, I know I'm not going to put a bunch of teams at number one on you. I already know <laughs> it's going to be one of the same top teams I had in the preseason because, they're, like you said, there's tears. You ain't just going to keep winning. It's not like, oh, this team's number one this week or this team will be number right, one. No, right, right, right. It's still going to be one of those, to me, one of those five or six teams at the top. Absolutely. We'll see. Uh, Arizona Compass learn, you know, you go to number one, then you drop a game. You get, it's very difficult. You know, it's difficult mm-hmm. to stay there. Uh, they're obviously we're the number one in our last Fat 50. So we'll update it one more time. But I think for now, we're going to get out of here again. We appreciate everybody listening in to episode 146. Hopefully you can go out and watch that Ray Lou Alley legend doc. But uh, till next time, Ronnie and Chelsea and Ani are signing off. Peace.